Richard Curry, originally known as the Dark Eldar before GW um, <clears throat> had to change it for trademark reasons. Now, to say they were surprised when 3rd Ed 40k was revealed and BAM, brand new army, would be accurate. Also, they were quite the image shift from the previous Eldar, and showing that 40k was going to the grim dark side a lot more than 2nd Ed did. Now, who the heck are they? Well, when Slash was birthed in existence by the murder fuck parties the Eldar been having, this split the Eldar into multiple factions. You had the Craftworld Eldar, who tried to escape on the Craftworlds. The Exodites, who were pretty much staying on their planets. The Harlequins, who went to the Black Library. And the Dark Eldar, who were kind of stuck in the middle of it and escaped into the Revway. While there, they took up residence in a colossal port of Komura. They made their home and constantly added to it using ships stolen from other races and anything they got from the raids. Now, while their craft world brethren trying to repent their own ways, the Exodites just lived the old-fashioned way and the Harlequins did stage plays, the Dark Elder went, fuck it, keep partying, and boy howdy did they, now constantly leading raids with the goal of causing mayhem, pillaging, and capturing new victims and bringing them back to the city. What happens to them there? Well, if they're lucky, they'll be given to the rich cults and forced to write in the arena till they die. Yes, that's the good option. The next option is they're given to the Cabals and will either be a slave or a torture doll for the rest of their lives. And the worst case is they go to the homunculi cults, and you don't want that. That's how you become a living meat puppet in constant agony for the rest of your life. Delightful. Suffice to say, this pretty much puts Dark Elder in one of the few 40k armies you can definitely put in the evil tier with no option. They are devious, vain, and totally self-serving with no respect for any other being, not even each other. And they will backstab and murder each other all the time. So yeah, quite the citrus of little puppies, aren't they? But let's talk rules and war gear first before we get into the full army as... Yeah, there's a few things to talk about here. So, they had three army rules. First off, fleet of foot. This meant any model that was not a vehicle, on a jet bike, hoverboard or jetpack, or one of the Monculus Cult's creations, could choose to run instead of shooting a weapon in the shooting phase. This let them move an extra d6 inches in the shooting phase and they could still assault afterwards. Always handy. Of course, they are raiders. And because of this, in missions that had attackers or defenders, they are always the attacker automatically, no questions. Alongside this, they captured prisoners during these raids. How this worked was if a unit falls back after losing to a Dark Elder unit in close combat, a dice was rolled, and the 4+, plus, one of the models is taken hostage. If the Dark Elder actually pursued and caught the unit, the entire unit was taken prisoner. Now, at the end of the game, each captured model the Dark Elder player had, they got one extra victory point. Always handy. Though this only applied to missions with victory points, so something to keep in mind. So yes, simple army rules, as 3rd edition was a bit simple to start with, being a completely new set of rules, and onto the war gear. Now, this is the edition all war gear became somewhat unique. So, bolt guns were still used by Imperial and Chaos Marines, for example. But the Orcs no longer acted them, Elder didn't have las guns, and so on and so forth. So, this means full weapon escalations for the Drukari now, as yeah, all this stuff was unique. Let's start with the Agonizers first. These lovely whips and barbed gauntlets directly affect the victim's nervous system for maximum pain. They were a normal close combat weapon, but always wounded on the 4 plus and ignored armor saves. If attacking a vehicle, they also also scored a glancing hit on a 6 which was something at least. Next up with a blaster, a short range weapon that fires a beam of dark energy that annihilates anything, even vehicle armor, with ease. It was range 12, strength 8, AP 2, assault 1, and it also reduced the armor of vehicles higher than 12 to 12. Very good short range gun that dealt with everything, including characters, as if the strength of a weapon is double the character's toughness, it instant kills them. Ah, the joys of some of the old rules. What next? Oh, the combat drugs. Primarily used by riches, these give them lots of benefits with the minor side effect of things like death. Now, it had six options you could choose. 
A Trail Adventure Assault move with 3d6 pursuit and full back, plus one weapon skill, plus one strength, always striking first in combat, re-rolling misses in combat, and plus one attack. Now at the start of the assault phase, you could choose as many of these as you wanted, but you had to roll a d6 for each one. If any of the results were double, they took a wound of no saves allowed. If any results were triple, they died outright. Yeah, could make them powerful that phase, but could also overdose. Ah well. The Crucible of Malediction is next, and this contains the trapped souls of psychers that are tortured by the Dark Eldar. It was classed as a shooting weapon that targeted all psychers within 24 inches of the wielder that had to pass a leisure test. If they succeeded, nothing happened. If they failed, their soul got sucked out and put in the Crucible, instantly killing them. This was powerful, but it was only one use per game. But yeah, against armies like Eldor and Tyranids, ooh, they felt it. I've had a few Hive Tyrants have their souls sucked out. Ugh. Anyway, back to the weaponry. The Dark Lance, the Blaster's big brother. It was 30 inches in range, strength 8, AP 2, heavy 1, and like the Blaster, reduced the armor of a vehicle to 12 if it was more. This is the primary long range anti vehicle weapon of the Dark Eldar. Next up, the Destructor. Used by the Homunculi, this sprays highly corrosive acid on the target that eats through almost any armor. It used the Flame Template, was strength 4 assault 1, and it rolled a d6 each time fired to see the AP value. The few times you want to roll a 1 instead of a 6 when using a weapon. Ah, oh, what next up? Ah, oh, yes, some gruesome talismans. Yeah, not surprised seeing Jakarbi walking around with an ear necklace or something, really. It counters two models for the outnumbering purposes of close combat, and even against demons, weirdly, but this wasn't too useful. Now, the first of the grenades, the Haywire Grenade, that basically generated an EMP when thrown. And by thrown, I mean using close combat, as grenades were during this time. When attacking a vehicle in close combat, they could be used. Another one, did nothing. Two to five, a glancing hit. And six, penetrating hit. Uh, Trend nuts and walkers need to be immobilized first though, otherwise they just bat them away. Next up, the Hellglaive. These are the weapons of Hellions, a cross between a modified splinter rifle that also has vicious cutting blades attached to it, making it a deadly close combat weapon. So, range wise, it was a splinter rifle, but in close combat, it gave plus one strength on the turn the model charged. This was fine, but it had no AP burst in close combat, so this was failed, especially against Marines. Now, you also had to take the Hellion Skyboard if you were using this, and this was a Jump pack, but it was shaped like a bat-like skyboard they rode. It gives the model a 12-inch move, and a 5 plus of bubble save against shooting attacks if they move the previous turn, and also lets them deep strike if they want. The Hell Mask is next, and yeah, these masks are usually made of the faces of other people designed to really intimidate your opponent. Any model wanting to strike the owner had to pass the leadership test or would only hit on sixes. Always a helpful thing. And we've got plasma grades. Now, the Dark Elder and normal Elder used these, and they basically counted as frag grenades, and simply meant the opponent didn't get cover bonuses in close combat, quite handy with the high initiative of Dark Elder. Now, the Dark Elder also have a nice variety of poison blades, able to pretty much affect anything, including Tyranids and Demons. The model always wounds on a 2 plus in close combat with these weapons because of that. However, this didn't stack with, say, your PAL weapon, you had to choose which one to use, so keep that in mind against armoured targets. The Punisher is a two-handed weapon, like a halberd, and it's usually ruled by the Incubi. It was a power weapon with plus one strength, so decent. Ooh, the Reaver Jetbike. The ultra-fast jetbikes that combine speed with the wielder's skill in close combat fighting to slice through enemies with the blades. The rider now had a 12 inch move, but could also turbo boost to 24 inches, but if doing so could not shoot or assault if they did so. Still, it did mean their armor save was down in vulnerable save till the next turn. The rider could also only have single handed weapons if riding this, and could not take the Crucible of Malediction or a Red Bay Portal that has the focus on driving. Next up, Scissor Hands, because Homunculi are into that sort of thing. This counter is a pair of poison blades, so always with another 2 plus, and granted plus 1 attacks. Ooh, the Shadow Field. This is a field of miasma of dark energy that surrounds the wielder, protecting them from all attacks. It gave a 2 plus of a save, which sounds pretty powerful, 
uh, when it failed a save, it was gone for good, so useful but not perfect. The Shredder. This is a handheld pistol that fired monofilament wire to shred enemies and had a 12 inch range, strength 6, no AP, but was an assault 1 blast. Soul Seeker ammunition next, and this is made from Elder Wave Foam, the Dark Elder have acquired, and allows the Wilder to ignore cover and re all hits with Splinter Weaponry. Speaking of the Splinter Weapons, these came in three flavours, and they all shoot Splinter Shards made from crystals filled with toxins. The pistol version has a 12 inch range, strength 3, AP5. The rifle, 24 inch range, strength 3, AP5, and was rapid fire. And the cannon, 24 inch range, strength 4, AP5, assault 4. The stinger is next, and another weapon of the homunculi that fires darts that make the victim's blood vessels steam up and then, um, explode. Delightful. It had a 12 inch range. AP of 6 and Assault 1, and it always wounded a 2 plus. Now it had a special rule that if the model died from this attack, it then exploded. And you place the blast template on the model, and everything else takes a hit with the strength of the model's toughness and AP of the armor. So with a marine, it'd be strength 4, AP 3. Yeah, this could be quite nasty in dealing with a whole squad. Now I must admit, a wrist-mounted grenade launcher is not what you would expect a Terrafex to be, but oh well. It had a 12 inch range, was an assault one blast weapon, and it didn't have a strength but instead anything it hit had to pass a leadership test or be pinned with minus one to the leadership if under half strength, and an extra minus one if it hits more than one modern unit. Back to the Incubi and their Tormentor Helms, the Dark Elder version of the Striking Scorpion Mandy Blaster helmet in a way. It could be fired as a splinter pistol, but also get a plus one attack in close combat. And of course, the Dark Elder have trophy racks, and yep, they are as screwed up as you think they are. If the owner kills them all in close combat, they add them to the rack, and they'll have plus one leadership for the rest of the game. This didn't stack if you killed multiple models though. Now, onto their final piece of normal war gear, the Redway Portal, which was linked to the Redway system that they use. During the shooting phase, if the model didn't move or shoot, it could place the portal down, and it took up the space of a blast template. From then on, any reserves the Dark Elder had could come from the portal with no risk and the portal could not be removed. You could also put any unit in reserve if you had this item in the army, so nice to get in just the right position and then poof, sudden army right where your enemy doesn't want them to be. Now, these items had no limits, you could have as many of them as wanted as long as they had the points for them. The next few are Arcane War Gear, and these were one off so you'd only take one of each. First up, the Animus Vitae. This device looks like a sphere of barbed wire, which when used explodes out catching anyone in it and draining their life force. Models captured by this give the owner of the Vitae 5 victory points, not 1, and once captured they also give the owner plus 1 weapon skill and strength for the rest of the game. It was alright. Archangel of Pain is a cask to contain a very pissed off demon. Mainly because it got captured by the Dark Elder and it's not happy about that. The demon could be released and when done so will blast the target with the flamer template and any model hit must pass a pinning test at Masu leadership. The demon then leaves back to the warp, probably flipping off the Dark Elder as it did. Pinning is useful but they had plenty of other ways to do it so this one didn't see much use. How about a Goblet of Spite? The Witch Cult loves using this thing. A succubus, or other sort of witch, that carries the goblet, and the unit she is in, always hits on a 3+, plus in hand-to-hand -hand combat, no matter what. Yeah, for a close combat dedicated unit, this is never a bad choice. Now we've got the Mask of the Damned, and this is the Hell Mask on steroids, as it plays on the victor's phobias and fears. Any unit that wanted to assault the wielder had to pass the leadership test. If they failed, they succumbed to their fear and couldn't assault that turn full stop. Hmm. Once a creepy nightmare doll which caused a delirium and disturbing visions to those it targeted? Well here you go. It lets the Dark Elder player re-roll who gets to choose which table edge or table quarter they get to deploy on. Handy, uh, but if it was used, the wielder took a strength free hit with no armor saves allowed 
as yeah, it turns out the doll doesn't like being used. Now, the Vexenthrope is not a Tyranid, but a mask made from bone and flayed skin that grows on the fairer's face and projects a friendly face of a loved one to the enemy. Man, even when they do a nice thing to them in a way, the Dukali somehow make it evil. This meant models wanting to hit the owner in close combat had to pass a leadership test or had to attack something else. Um, Tyranids, Necrons, Wraithguard, Demons and Vehicles didn't care about this for fairly obvious reasons. Finally, the Xenospasm is an upgraded Turfex, which basically does the same thing, but it was now strength 3 and AP 3, so it could pin and kill models now. Okay, we done? Well, for the infantry, yes we are. Now on to their vehicle upgrades. First, the Horrorfex, and oh look, it's a Terrorfex again, but the vehicle version this time. It functioned exactly the same, but had an 18-inch range as, you know, bigger version of it. Now, the first unique thing is the Night Shield. This covers it in a field of darkness, making it hard to make out. When shooting at a vehicle with this, you counted the range the model was at being 6 inches more than it was. So, if the model was 12 inches away, it counted as being 18. And if this was now more than the weapon's range, they couldn't target it. Always helpful to have, uh, considering the low armour of Dark Elder vehicles. Now, being pirates, they had scaling nets on their raiders. This allowed the occupants to embark or disembark at any point of the vehicle's move as long as it doesn't go over 12 inches at a turn. It does, however, make it easier to hit the radio in close combat, and the skimmer of rule of needing a 6 to hit was now a 4+. Plus. Also, if it had this, it could not have the scythes or slave snares upgrades. It could have screaming jets still, though, this allowing them to soar and drop from the skies of a screaming whale. This granted them the deep strike rule and could be used even if normally not allowed. Models still couldn't dispart the turn at deep strike still though. Now the scythes across the vehicle's hull gave it some combat protection, and any model that rolled a 1 to hit got caught and took a strength 5 hit. Alongside that, the slave snares made capturing enemies while moving a lot easier. If the skimmer moved 12 inches and over a unit, it did D6 strength 4 hit, and any casualties this did were counted as captured prisoners, so handy for vehicles. They also had torch amps, where the screams of the captors are played over loudspeakers. This let the Dark Elder vehicles tank shock when they normally couldn't. Finally, they were usually covered with gruesome trophy racks. Any model within 6 inches of the vehicle had minus 1 to the leadership look at them, this didn't stack if you found them multiple raiders, for example, though. And yes, that's their war gear. A wide variety of weapons and tools at disposal, and quite effective some of them. But yeah, things like agonizers, shadow fields, and some of the obvious, obvious ones were really good, were taken really fairly often, compared to some of the other things where it was like, they were a bit too niche. But hey, always nice to have the option. Next time, we're going to move into the HQ section and the characters and bodyguard the Dark Elder could take in 3rd edition.